So sometimes, not kind of like I did with uh, the Bag of Wonders, but sometimes questions, sometimes simple questions get simple answers. Simple questions often sometimes get simple answers. So try these questions on for size, all right? So how old are you? You could answer, right? We'll just make up a number. Three. What do you want for dinner? Uh, beef stew with the biscuits. How was work today? Fine. What did you learn in church today? Uh, they stumped the pastor with that really cool bag of wonders thing. Will you mow the lawn? No, it's too hot. When's vacation Bible school? Tomorrow. Are you excited about going? Yep. What's the meaning of life? Shoulder shrug. Life is full of questions. And sometimes we have to hope that the questions that we're asking are the right ones. And sometimes we hope that we get more than a two or three word answer. Maybe sometimes we're not asking the right question. Or maybe we need to phrase that question differently. Regardless of that fact, though, sometimes simple questions often get simple answers. And we're faced with two questions today in the life of faith. You might simply say that they're easy enough to answer, and maybe they're simple too, but I'm not so sure about that. Sometimes if the questions that seem so simple come up in church, and there are Sundays and Sunday school lessons devoted to them, then maybe the questions aren't really that simple after all. Our two questions for this morning come from the Gospel of Luke. We've been on this journey with Jesus through the ninth and the 10th chapters of the Gospel of Luke for a couple of weeks, and Jesus has talked about what it means to follow him. We call that discipleship, and last week he called together 70 disciples to send them out in pairs to all of the places that he himself wanted to go. The disciples were to travel light, to not take much with them, but they were to proclaim that the kingdom of God has come near. That was the message. And those same 70 people came back, and they were amazed at their power that even the demons would actually submit to them and listen to them. Jesus goes on in the Gospel of Luke. He continues to be grateful for them. He praises God and thanks God for revealing things to the disciples through himself. And it's after that, as we pick up our story, that this lawyer stands up intending to test Jesus. And he asks the first of our two questions this morning. He asks, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now our reading today starts with a lawyer. And when we tend to think of lawyers, we tend to think of suits and briefcases and benches and judges and gavels and rulings and sentences and maybe even the doink-doink from TV's Law and Order. That's what I think of. But the lawyer in Luke's gospel wasn't trained in a law school. He was trained in seminary. He was skilled in the art of rhetoric and speaking, but so that he could, um, but so that he could debate or defend or teach. He knew the law, but the law was the Torah that contains words and laws, but also promises. So yes, the lawyer knew how to speak, and he knew how to use the law, not necessarily to defend or to persecute or prosecute, excuse me, but to put together rules and commands and statutes and ordinances so that people would know what to do in the life of faith. And doing something in the life of faith often means doing some things but not doing other things. And so this lawyer knows his stuff. He lives life in some ways ready to point out the proper way to live a religious life. And Jesus is probably not surprised whatsoever to hear his question, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You see, the gospel of Jesus is pretty clear. In the long run of things, you don't have to do anything at all. But this is still early on in Jesus' ministry with the disciples. He's still with them, and perhaps he can make an example of this. And so he plays just a little bit with a lawyer this morning. Jesus asks him, well, what does the law tell you, since you know the law? Knowing that from the basic Torah 101 class that he took, the lawyer recites Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, which is called the Shema. And he says to Jesus, 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And that's the part when he says it that we all want to applaud. Yay, he did it. He did it. That was correct. Jesus can't say anything against that because it's the basic answer. He tells the lawyer, that's correct. Do this and you will live. It was sort of a simple question, at least for the lawyer, and he gave the most basic common answer that any Jewish person probably would have. Jesus says, well done, do it, and you're fine. And the guy probably should have stopped right there. You heard the phrase, stop while you're ahead? Well, but Luke tells us he didn't. He wanted to justify himself, as the gospel says. And so the lawyer asks our second question for this morning. Who is my neighbor? You know, maybe he wanted to make sure he was right in who he included in his neighbor's circle. Or maybe he wanted to feel just about who he didn't include in his neighbor's circle. Who knows? It was a simple enough question that we would expect a simple enough, straightforward answer from Jesus, right? Well, not really, because Jesus hardly ever gives simple, straightforward answers. The lawyer probably would have liked an answer that would have resonated with his work experience, and so he probably hoped that Jesus would say something like what my favorite theologian Frederick Buechner offers to us. Buechner says, Jesus could have said, very well, Henceforth, a neighbor, hereafter referred to as the party of the first part, shall be defined as meaning a a person of Jewish ascent, descent, whose legal residence is within a radius of no more than three statute miles from one's own legal residence, unless there is a person of Jewish descent, hereafter referred to as the party of the second part, living closer to the party of the first part than one is oneself, in which case the party of the second part is to be construed as the neighbor to the party of the first part, and one is oneself relieved of all responsibility of any kind to the matters hereunto appertaining. The lawyer probably hoped for that answer. He could understand that answer, But that's not the one that Jesus gives. Jesus gives to the lawyer and to us this morning his answer in a parable. And we know that parable is the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is probably the second most famous story in the Gospel of Luke after the prodigal son story. Many of us have grown up with this story, the parable of the Good Samaritan and the moral that it teaches us. But there's nothing good in this parable. I would rather not call it the parable of the Good Samaritan, but I would rather call it the parable of the dude stuck in the ditch. And the gist of that story is this. A man was going down from Jerusalem. Now this is not a particular guy. It's not a Jewish guy, not a Gentile guy. This is just a nondescript guy. Some dude, some guy was taking a trip when he gets mugged. The robbers beat him senseless. They take his money and clothes and they leave him in his underwear in the mud of a ditch near dying. Two religious people, a priest and a Levite, both of whom are high up in the religious world, see the guy and you would think would help the guy, but they walk way on the other side of the road pretending not to see him so that they could get around him. The third guy passing by is a Samaritan. And at this point, I have to imagine the lawyer, as Jesus is talking, is clenching his teeth just a little bit and saying, A Samaritan? Jews and Samaritans didn't get along very well. They practically hated each other, and it would be like today calling someone a Nazi or a Taliban member. They were regarded that darkly. But the Samaritan is the hero, though. He rushes to the guy in the ditch. He does first aid and CPR right there in the trenches, so to speak. He picks him up. He puts him on his donkey. He takes him to a hotel, pays for his medical care and stay, and promises to come back in a day or two to check in on him. The Samaritan's sole focus was on the other guy, not himself, And he stands in stark contrast to the lawyer who Jesus is talking to, whose focus seems to be on what he has to do and who he has to pay attention to. 
And we'd expect Jesus at this point in the story to come back with an, all right, you wanted to know who your neighbor is and it's the guy in the ditch. But again, that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says and asks the lawyer, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the other, into the, of the robbers? And you see, that's a subtle shift for Jesus, but it's a big one. And it's a big one, especially for us, too. You see, sometimes we try and act like this lawyer all the time. All we need to do is scan the horizon to see out there who actually is my neighbor and who makes the count. But Jesus turns this around so that figuring that out is less important than us actually acting like a neighbor to everyone we meet. You know, what those folks look like, how they treat us, maybe what they smell like, or what they think of the, the, gra- what they think of the length of the grass in our yard is, and if we have stuff in common is not nearly as important as making sure that whoever they are, wherever they might be, even walking in the doors in front of us, we are their neighbors. Jesus' shift at the end of the reading, helps to make this less about us and them and more about our response to our neighbors, namely that we show grace and love and mercy wherever we go. The truth is that if we are constantly the bearers and the reflectors and the image of God to other people, then we don't need to ask who is my neighbor because that won't matter. If we're already being a neighbor ourselves, then the question becomes irrelevant and we don't need to justify ourselves because God, through Jesus, has already done that for us. Simple questions sometimes have simple answers, but sometimes they have complex answers. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Do this and you will live. Who is my neighbor? Well, the one who showed mercy. Jesus says, go and continue doing likewise. It's as simple and as complex as that. Amen.